but I think it's something you all need to know. Um, so it's the, the cube rule of food identification. There is food in it. If that will impact you, please leave the room until the next talk. It's about food. So a question has plagued scholars for decades. In fact, I've just realized I don't have my note screen. <laughs> that, that could be uh, difficult for me. How do I get my note screen? Give me my note screen. Please hold. <laughs> Aaron, do elevator music. Technical difficulties. <laughs> there we go, I have my notes now. Um, so yeah, a question has played scholars for decades. Are hot dogs sandwiches? <laughs> New York State says yes. For tax reasons, hot dogs are sandwiches, as are burgers, uh, open face sandwiches, breakfast sandwiches, and gyros. Uh, the British Sandwich Association says no. It's <laughs> quite a heated debate. Does it matter? And it's grown to other foods as well. So this is a declaration saying pop tarts are a kind of ravioli. <laughs> And deep dish pizza is not a pizza, but a casserole. <laughs> but the oracle phosphatides actually solved this for us. The cube rule was born. So according to the cube rule, there are six groups. <laughs> <laughs> and food is classified by the location of its structural starch. <laughs> Structural starch being a solid piece that holds it together. So first up, we have toast. This is defined by one piece of structural starch on one side. So examples of toast are pizza, <laughs> cookies, and apple crumble, which is upside down toast. <laughs> Next up, we have sandwiches, which means that the item is surrounded on two sides. So examples of sandwiches are jammy dodgers, <laughs> lasagna, which is a multi-layer sandwich, and Victoria sponge cake. Next up we have tacos, surrounded on three sides. So examples of tacos, we have hot dogs. They aren't a sandwich, they're a taco. <laughs> uh, Subway sandwiches, because they don't cut all the way through. And a slice of pie, which is a taco on its side. <laughs> Next up we have sushi. So sushi is surrounded on four sides. Examples of this are falafel wraps, sausage rolls, and cannoli. And then we have quiche, which is surrounded on five sides, so four and either the top or the bottom. So examples of this are jam tarts, soup in a bread bowl, and toad in the hole. We also have Chicago deep dish pizza. It's not a casserole, it's a quiche. Uh, a whole lemon meringue pie, so you can't slice it. And a pastel de matter. And then we have calzones. Calzones are completely encased. So this means stuff like burritos or steak bakes, or pork pies, and dumplings, and jam donuts, and a whole unsliced beef wellington. <laughs> if you slice the beef wellington, it becomes sushi. <laughs> there are some additional rulings on this. So if there is no structural starch, it's a salad. <laughs> Which means that you get steak is a salad. <laughs> spaghetti is a salad, because there's no structure to spaghetti, it's a blob. And chocolate, because you can be really healthy and have chocolate for lunch and it's a salad. We also have mashed potatoes, chips and cheese, and soup, which is a wet salad. Uh, any 
form of starch, any block of starch that's not sliced, that's just a block of starch, is toast. So this means that muffins are toast, <laughs> a whole loaf of bread is toast, and crumpets are toast. Uh, and the final one is a villainous vanilla soy latte is a three bean soup, which means that it's a three bean wet salad. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm glad that I got to do that. <laughs> Right, so back on to serious topics now. Um, next up we have Yusuf Balkasemi, who is a full stack dev and software architect for a company that builds systems for public health, based in Shipley. Um, you might know him from helping me out a lot around here, doing things like when I'm not here hosting, um, and like getting the pizzas when they're really late and I'm doing other things. Uh, and he's gonna be doing a talk about Storybook, which is something I've used but don't know a lot about. So thank you very much, Yusuf. Thank you. Okay, let's see if this is gonna work. Oh, and he's using the same font as me. Yeah. <laughs> I did I did actually take it from you, so <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, so um so thanks for uh, thanks Luke for for uh, <laughs> the announcement and for that brilliant talk. I'm just here. Yeah, I've been crying. So anyway, so my, my talk's titled Tell Your Story, uh, Your Component Story with Storybook. So, um, so Luke already mentioned so who I am. So I'm a senior full stack software engineer at Infact, and yeah, freelance also under Spectorium Limited. And my primary expertise lies in .NET um, and Angular, but I do a lot of um, sort of Node and Rails on the side as well. So first of all, let's define what are components that we're talking about here. So here I'm talking about components as in UI components. So these are independent and reusable bits of UI logic, uh, usually represented by custom HTML elements. And the, these UI components are core concepts in Angular, Vue, and React. So this is how I felt when I first found out about components in, in Angular and React, and they, it got me really, really excited to actually work with them. Why? So for this sort of reason. So it, it allowed, after years of working with jQuery and Backbone and just a, a sort of custom build vanilla JavaScript frameworks, here, here came the tools that allowed to build reusable pieces of UI logic allowed to easily um, organize functionality into sort of hierarchies and clearly defined use cases. Um, it allowed to be more effective in communicating the intent of the components that we build between members of the team and sort of external stakeholders. And uh, finally, it allowed to actually finally easily package those reusable bits of UI logic to distribute it um, externally. However, as with anything, components came with challenges. And uh, usually we start with building the first component, the second, the third, the tenth, then is the hundredth, then two hundredth, and yeah, and we get into some really sort of complex areas where maintaining large number of components becomes an, an issue. Understanding and managing component hierarchies can become a problem. Understanding how the components interact with each other, how they link to each other. Um, communicating the components intent becomes an issue because we all remember what the component was doing at the time we were writing it, then it's left for months, maybe years, and then we don't know what it's doing anymore. And prototyping and developing new components becomes harder because we need to bring a lot more components together to actually be able to try something new. Um, documenting to the rescue. So obviously, documenting our components can help us enormously in uh, um, uh, fighting some of these challenges. Documentation can help us understand what each component is doing and uh, understand it both at when we actually write it and after we come back to it later. It can make it much easier to communicate components intent to other team members. Um, it will increase discoverability of our components both internally and if we distribute them externally and it should improve the maintainability of our components. Documentation comes with its own challenges. It's first of all, can be a laborious task, depending on sort of what, what kind of documentation strategies we choose. It can be difficult to maintain because documentation is not code. So yes, yeah, somebody has to 
uh, have the process in place to actually maintain this properly. And for UI components specifically, it can be sometimes hard to describe UI components functionality purely in text. And finally, it can be pretty boring to <coughs> documentation. So how to document components? Um, there are a few sort of types of documentation that exist for any sort of code that you write. We can document um, outside of our code, which is probably not a great idea, but yeah, we can have Evernote, Word, whatever uh, word processing software we use to create documentation. We can and should uh, document our components in code using um, the best practices for um, the framework of your choice or for the, for, for the obviously for JavaScript uh, or uh, if you're using TypeScript, uh, TypeScript. Or we can use documentation tools in combination with uh, uh, do uh, documentation in code. Um, this is some of the tools that are widely used in React and IBM. <coughs> so build, style guide list, docs, storybook, and type doc. Today, yeah, I would like to talk to you about Storybook. So Storybook is a uh, open source um, UI uh, the components of development uh, framework. And what Storybook gives us, it allows us to build UI components in isolation. It allows us to go document uh, use cases as stories. Uh, it allows to use Markdown in code for writing documentation. Um, it also allows us to mock hard to reach use cases and we also can reuse the stories that we write in UI testing. Why I think using Storybook is a good idea? Because we can produce interactive documentation very quickly and efficiently. Uh, we can build static documentation sites in a matter of minutes. We can have our documentation act as um, test cases, which means that documentation doesn't become, doesn't stay as a burden that needs to be maintained. It becomes part of our whole development life cycle. Um, and we can use Storybook for prototyping components. So the whole issue of not being able to isolate a particular component to just try it, prototype it, and then show it to the world. And uh, finally, Storybook now supports all major JavaScript frameworks, so including React, Vue, and Angular. <coughs> which which opens the gates for a wide reach. So just um, to I'll demonstrate a quick demo. This is a, a lightning talk, um, and basically, to add Storybook to your React application, you just need one npx command. So if you were to use Angular, you would just replace <coughs> React with Angular. This basically will create. <coughs> A project. Well, the, the, the I've added um, um, Storybook to uh, um, uh, to a default Create React app, and essentially by default it creates a folder called Stories, places some default stories in there. I have added a custom compo a simple component called Vote Counter, and <coughs> added some associated stories for that Vote Counter component. Just to show you how. So yeah, I also added two add-ons for Storybook. One is called Knobs, which allows us to add sort of interactive bi uh, uh, bits to, to our components so we can actually um, uh, try out uh, uh, different uh, for values for props and etc. And the other one is called docs which adds some more com uh, customizations to how the actual uh, final documentation will look. So here's an example of the vote, well, here's the code for the vote counter component. So it's a very, very simple component that uses React hooks and it literally has just um, a title property that can come in as a prop, um, and it has an internal uh, sort of like state that can be incremented by um, using a very simple button. So we placed some standard JavaScript uh, sort of documentation comments to, to the actual component, so just, um, um, and uh, we placed a documentation to the actual definition of the prop. So I've used prop types in this case, but if you are using TypeScript, for example, in um, in um, your, your workflow, so then you can just place those, um, yeah, describe the interfaces for your props eventually. And here is how the stories look for that particular component. So the um, latest versions of Storybook, uh, they've, in the latest versions, they've changed the format uh, of writing stories. So whereas before you used to call all sorts of different custom methods from the Storybook API, 
to actually build your stories. Now you can use this so-called uh, component story format to actually write your uh, components as very simple, uh, to write your stories as sort of uh, very um, simple variables that just actually denote what you're doing. So in here we have um, <coughs> the, the default export which defines the title for our um, the sort of stories. Uh, for, for the so the overarching title for the for, for the collection of the stories in this case it will be the the stories about the vote counter uh, we actually add um, some custom um, the storybook logic to actually allow us to have interactive uh, bits of uh, UI for passing our props and then we just describe what is the component that these stories are related to and this is I just showed an example of how you would add some a subtitle to your documentation Finally, there are three stories here. So a basic one that just will just um, uh, output so the result of so passing this sort of component logic. Um, um, the one with title, where we pass a hard-coded title as a prop, and the other one with uh, a dynamic title, where we basically pass um, a function from um, the knobs library that allows us to actually interact with the story. So finally, we just need to hit npm run storybook, so which are the, these are convenient scripts that are added by that first uh, sort of command I showed to you, and this will produce a static website that looks like this. Can everybody see? If I can just do that. So essentially, you can see you get a nice left-hand side menu. This got automatically produced based on the stories that I've specified in my vote counter stories file. And you can see the three stories got added. So I can go into them. You can see that we straight away see how the component looks and works. <coughs> it's all interactive. So we can see that our uh, state is actually getting updated. And then if we add no knobs, basically it means that we can actually start passing the values to the story straight away from here. Finally, the docs page is also generated automatically based on the definition of that story. So you can see that um, um, the um, you can see this, the 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 um, actual comment that I've placed on the vote counter uh, component appears here. The description of the component, the subtitle added to the documentation appears there. And all of our, all of the three of our stories, so sort of display as stories in so sort of visual format, allowing us to very clearly see what the code is doing. For every single story as well, we can see the code to know how it was implemented. And because I've added, because I've used prop types in React and I've added some comments to the properties, it also builds a table of our properties just there. So, pretty simple to generate documentation with zero effort. Okay. Yeah, so where to go next from here? So basically, I would encourage you to visit the official documentation. The documentation of Storybook is really, really, really good. Uh, there is, people have used it for a while now, so there is loads of help in the GitHub issues. Um, and uh, you can look at some examples. They have um, a nice sort of examples page of showing how where it's used in the wild. And I was quite impressed to see the gov.uk website, for example, has definition of their components um, in a storybook format as well. And then you yeah, try adding it to your project and yeah, have a play with it. So thank you very much. Cool. Thank you very much, Yusuf. Um, so for our final talk of 2019, um, we have Jordan Finneran. Uh, I got the year right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Jordan is a data engineer at the Data Sheds, um, and he's going to be telling us about the bits of HTML that mean um, we don't necessarily need JavaScript, which is a controversial subject at a JavaScript meetup. <laughs> but we have to be responsible with JavaScript. So take it away, Jordan. Hi everyone, um, so yeah, I'm going to do something a bit controversial and say that we maybe shouldn't use JavaScript all the time as our first go-to thing, because HTML can do it. Um, 
One thing I want to point out first, which I'm sure we all know and love, is the fact that the web is getting slower. Uh, we are adding more and more JavaScript, we are adding more and more videos, images. Uh, marketing departments are giving you massive 4K images to put on websites and make it load in a second. Um, and the web is getting slower. Also, more people are coming online and using low power devices, which is also making the web slower. Uh, and also, uh, interesting fact that uh, people who browse the web on tablets, such as iPad, often actually have a much slower browsing experience because they don't often update them as much as phones, because how often do you change an iPad? Is that alright? Is it flickering? One second. No. Okay. Go back. Back. Cool. Um, so I want to show the power of HTML. Did you try to get rid of the JavaScript? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fighting back. Um, so first of all, I actually need to update this. So I will do that. Uh, that bit is entirely editable by the fact you have a content editable attribute on a HTML element. You can add that to any HTML element you want, and people can edit it. So if you want to like, make a really, really super basic um, editor that the users can edit, you could make it content editable and then just grab it when in JavaScript when it changes. Um, but let's build a website and we'll add a few basic things that you know we want. So modal, collapsing sections, tool tips, color inputs, autocompletes, all the kind of jazz that we kind of want with a website. Can everyone see this okay by the way? I don't need to zoom in. Um, so if we do all that, we add about a megabyte of minified JavaScript and over five, uh, 4.5 seconds of download time. So now I'm gonna awkwardly make us all wait that amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that loads, great. Um, I found that out by importing just these packages. So this is Bundlephobia, which is a, a it's not I really love. Um, if you stick a package in there, it will tell you how long it'll take to download and the size of it and stuff. Um, there are some real shockers. So I just loaded up a couple of different ones, all different components, all different language, uh, not language, frameworks. So you've got a color input from React, which takes two seconds to download. Uh, you've got a date input, you've got a progress bar, tooltip, if you want to do a tooltip, you've got a iron collapsing section, which is collapsible, and a modal. So all that adds up to a long time. So we're gonna have to wait to download all that stuff. And we don't actually need to, because it's actually all built into the browser um, already. And this is the amount of time it takes just to download these bits, never mind all the frameworks that we're gonna add and our actual business logic and you know the actual important things. Um, so let's not use that, let's use what the browser gives us. So I'm going to open up the HTML alongside this. So this is a dialog built completely with just HTML. Um, you can see here that it is just a dialog. Um, there's some inline JavaScript because I wrote this last night. Um, <laughs> and you can see that uh, you can just add whatever content you want inside this dialog. You can make it go away. You can use CSS to style the background if you want to style the background and make it colors or whatever you need it to do. Um, but that's really simple, right? You don't need to import however long it was, a second's worth of JavaScript to download. You can just use the dialog tag, which I know is also really confusing because they don't always name the HTML elements the best because it could be modal, dialog, whatever you want to call it. Um, the next one we've got is a collapsing section, which I only found out about recently, but I really like. So you've got a nice little collapsing section that can just collapse in and out. Um, you can see it here. So you've got the details one, and then that has a summary element. Oops, too far. Um, which has a summary here. Uh, the summary is the bit that's displayed when it is uh, collapsed, and then everything else inside of it is shown uh, when it's toggled open, which is really great, because <laughs> again, it's like, what, like 10 characters that you've got to type. Autocomplete on the other <laughs> side, and you've got a nice little collapsing section. Um, next, we've got progress, progress bar. So uh, this is a progress bar, which doesn't have a value set at the minute, so it will just poll for ages. If you actually want to start the progress bar going, then you can start, start it going, and it'll tick through. The HTML for that is also really simple. So you can see here, you've got, a, you've got progress. Um, that has a max value of 10, which is ignored. Um, and then I literally just incremented the value, and that uh, when it doesn't have a value, it will pull that back and forwards, and when you set the value, it will just slowly increment up. Again, don't need another two seconds of JavaScript. It's just a simple element. 
and that one's actually named sensibly which is great because they aren't always tooltips which is my number one bugbear for websites tooltip <laughs> <laughs> or title because they named it sillily again um, that one is really simple you just add a title attribute to it um, if anyone comes to you and says they need to style a tooltip they should have more important things to do with their lives <laughs> because it's a tooltip. You don't need to style it, it's there in an emergency. Uh, dates, which is slightly controversial because uh, if you need to support Safari, you might have to polyfill this one um, because Apple. But uh, in all other browsers, you get a really nice date picker, including Edge Beta, which is in Chromium. And that looks really nice, and you don't have to handle any formatting or any kind of time zones because you don't. You should really shouldn't want to handle time zones. And that one's even simpler. That is literally an input type date. You can also do date times where you can capture date and time, um, and date time local, which will also help you capture a user's time zone if you want. Uh, if you want to capture colors, this is a new one. So if you need to capture color, so if you decide to want to use like brand customization on a website, say if you're like selling to other businesses, you could just put <coughs> a color picker in and they just pick whichever color they want and they can change the background of their website. And autocomplete, which again is another one of my bugbears um, because it just uses a data list. So you can just list as many options as you want and you get a nice little autocomplete. You don't have to include any libraries, you don't have to do anything like that. It'll also handle all the searching for you, so you don't actually have to put any logic in for how to search something. It just does it because it's in the browser, and thankfully, Chromium engineers and people who are way smarter than me have done it all, tested it all, and that means that we've got less to do, which is good, right? Less tests, less t stuff for us to do. We can focus on more important jazzy things, like building electron apps and, uh, and maps, rather than having to build and write tests for a autocomplete JS library, which obviously will have issues raised against it. Um, and that's it, really. Really speedy talk through the power of HTML. Um, I really love it because the less JavaScript I have to write and the less bugs I can introduce, the better, because I like to stick with HTML elements um, and use a JavaScript only when necessary because we have great power as developers. I'm steal the line from earlier. <laughs> we have great power with JavaScript developers. Um, but that comes with great responsibility, right? We should only use it when necessary and where we need to, not just chuck it in because we can npm install everything now. Um, yeah, so that's it really. Uh, yeah, if anyone wants to have a chat about any of them or anything, just give me a shout. And that's me on Twitter and GitHub.